Hello? Take a few minutes to get people to give people a chance to join. So we're going to be talking about the climate friendly backyard. Lionel, my man, you're in Mexico City, right? Yeah. Welcome. Thanks so much. I'm sorry I didn't uh, hear you. I just connect um, the audio. Hmm? So happy it's to have you. you. Yeah, sorry. Sound well. What? Okay, I'm gonna put out my video to be able to listen uh, carefully. Hmm? Okay. Welcome everyone. We're gonna get started about 7.05. Feel free to introduce yourself and say where you're from. I'm Hart Hagen, I'm based in Louisville, Kentucky. And this is through the Water and Climate Facebook group. Also affiliated with Soil for Climate. Sure we're probably gonna be interested. Richard Rob. Sometimes you can share it. There's sometimes a share button at the bottom. Here. Well, no, that's a. I don't know. We've got Pam, Mark, Ann, Glenn, and Lionel. Uh, one more minute. Well, I'll start the slideshow. It'll the slideshow is about eight to ten minutes long, and then we will have a discussion. Hello, Ann. How are you? Hi, Hart. I'm fine. And where where do you live? I'm in Louisville, Kentucky. Okay, awesome. I'm in New Mexico. So. How are you? Yeah, yeah. So, Kentucky. Have you been there your whole life? I have, nearly my whole life. I lived eight years in Tennessee, one year in Pennsylvania, the rest in Kentucky. Wow, that's awesome. We get plenty of rain, that's for sure, but just because you get plenty of rain doesn't mean you're storing it properly. Very true. It needs to, you need to have good soil, right? Right. Yeah. Uh, New Mexico has Brad Lancaster, in, in my understanding. Have you heard of Brad Lancaster? He's really good. No, I haven't. So. Oh, well, look him up. Is he? He's written a couple of books on rainwater harvesting. He's got a lot okay. of good stuff on YouTube. Oh, look him up. Thank you. All right. It's 7.05. Let me just uh, share my screen. <clears throat> Okay, this presentation is Grow More, Mow Less. It's my belief and understanding that, that we, we just cut down too much stuff. 
and we would do much better to let more green grass grow. I mean, my philosophy of uh, my philosophy of the world, one of the main things the world needs is to rehydrate the earth. A lot of the things that we consider to be climate problems, uh, yes, they're climate problems, but they're much more attributable to broken water cycles than they are to uh, greenhouse gases alone. So if we rehydrated the earth, we'd have a lot of cooling, we would be able to grow more green plants, we would um, be able to restore our ecosystems. So this presentation relates to what we can do in our own yards for that. So uh, your climate friendly backyard, grow more, mow less. Uh, let's talk about how we can mow less and experience the benefits in terms of, of, um, of soil health, water infiltration, carbon absorption, and plant diversity. What we normally do is we normally mow at two to four inches. We do this because it's traditional. It's what we've always seen. It's what society values. It's what the neighbors expect, but it's not healthy. And we need to uh, deviate from societal norms when we can. In this video or video or slideshow, we'll talk about how to mow higher, how to mow less area, and how to let trees grow more. What we normally do, let's talk about what we normally do versus what we should do. What we normally do, number one, is we normally mow too low and we mow too much area. What we should do is we should mow higher and we should mow less area. What we normally do, number two, is we mow down all of our tree seedlings. What we should do is we should let some of our tree seedlings grow. We have these volunteer trees that are, they just want to grow. A lot of times we don't need to buy and plant trees. We just need to let the trees grow that are trying to grow. And volunteer trees will grow better than uh, what we get in the nursery typically. Sometimes what you get in the nursery grows just fine, but there's a lot, there's money involved, there's labor involved. I'm taking some of my cues here from Doug Tallamy, who's a, that's, a, that's another story, but famous um, entomologist and native plant expert there's, there's no tree that's going to grow better than one that just volunteers. What we normally do, number three, is we mow down all the blooms that feed the pollinators. What we should do is we should let our grass grow taller so some wildflowers can grow to feed the pollinators. So when you mow, you're, you're mowing down the blooms. And, and we should... Uh, I'm going to see if I can mute people that are that have some background noise if you have some background noise could you kindly uh mute yourself let's see here i don't know how to i don't know how to do that anyway we'll, we'll go with it uh, so when we mow the first things that get cut down are the blooms and the blooms could otherwise feed the pollinators what we normally do, number four, is we, we use heavy equipment that packs the soils down, causing runoff. What we should do is we should avoid the heavy equipment and preserve spongy soil that soaks up rainwater. You know, this heavy equipment that we use for mowing, I mean, it, it, it uses carbon, it spews out carbon. The manufacture of these machines, not just in the useful life of a mower, but the manufacture of a mower is a polluting, carbon-intensive process. So we need to use less of the heavy equipment. What we normally do, number five, is we cut grass short so the roots stay short. And this is not very healthy or drought proof. When you cut grass down to two inches, then the roots tend to not get very long. When you let grass grow taller, like six to nine inches, as I recommend, then those roots are going to be taller. So what we should do is we should let grass grow so the roots get longer and nurture that healthy, spongy soil. Any roots that we have in the ground, they're going to be injecting carbon into the ground. Uh, on average, plants take about 30% of the sugars that they make. So through photosynthesis, they take... Um, uh, photosynthesis takes carbon dioxide 
and water and turns it into sugar and oxygen. So those sugars that the plant makes through photosynthesis, about a third of them are gonna be injected into the soil. Whenever we can have living roots into the soil, we're storing carbon and we're nurturing healthy soils and that the, the healthy soils and the carbon are able to store a whole lot of water so that contributes to green growth. It sustains green growth. It makes our landscape more drought proof when we just let plant, plants grow taller, let the roots grow deeper and experience the benefits of that. What we normally do, summary, we mow too low, we mow down tree seedlings, we mow down wildflowers, we use heavy equipment uh, and we pack down the soil. What we should do is we should mow higher, let the tree seedlings grow, let the wildflowers grow and avoid heavy equipment. So now how to mow higher. I'll be talking about mowing higher. We're talking about how to do that. Actually, I'm gonna recommend using a weed eater rather than a mower because you can cut it higher. So how to mow higher, number one, don't let the entire, don't mow the entire yard at two to four inches height. Only mow at two to four inches height in places where you wanna walk or play. We don't need to mow everything in sight. We can, you know, grass serves the function of being able to walk on it without killing it. You can walk on it occasionally and with some regularity without killing it. That's the function of turf grass. We don't need to do that everywhere. We need, only need to do it where we need to walk or play. Doug Tallamy recommends that we reduce our mowed areas by half and plant the rest in, with trees and native plants. How to mow higher, number two, wherever you don't walk or play, use the weed eater, not a mower. The weed eater can cut higher, but it, it'll be low enough. It'll, it'll be low enough. I, I cut my yard at like six to nine inches. I just top it off and it's low enough. In my city, the ordinance says you have to be 10 inches or less. So I'm gonna be under that 10 inches, but I'm not gonna cut it down to the nub because I don't think that makes for a healthy landscape. <laughs> Let me see, I'm gonna take a minute just to see if I can figure out how to mute everybody and then we'll unmute everybody when we um when we uh start the discussion let me see here how do you do that hmm. mute no i'm not going to mute me well i'm just gonna have to figure that out next time on not I? okay uh, but the person who has the dog if you would please just mute yourself for a little while uh so how to mow higher, whenever you don't, wherever you don't walk or play, use a weed eater, not a mower. The weed eater can cut higher, but it will be low enough. Uh, how to mow higher, number three, use the weed eater to top off the grass at six to nine inches. This is taller than any mower. You know, mowers go up to about five inches max. But so, but a weed eater can cut taller. This, this is taller than any mower, but it's short enough to give the grass some shape. And, uh, how to mow higher number four try to hold the weed eater steady as you move back and forth it takes a little it takes a little practice but it doesn't have to be perfect you only have to cut off the very tops of the grasses you're not mowing it so it takes less energy and less effort how to mow higher number five understand that this will be a different look but it'll be nice and it'll be much more climate friendly now, the summary on how to mow higher, only mow where you walk or play. Where you don't walk or play, use a weed eater to cut at six to nine inches. Hold the weed eater steady, but it doesn't have to be perfect. It's a different look, but much more climate friendly. Now, we've done about two thirds of this presentation. We're moving into the last third of it. We've talked about how to mow higher. Now let's talk about the benefits of taller grass. Benefits of taller grass, number one, taller grass will hold more water. Our climate needs to have more plant matter. It needs to have more water. Having more plant matter creates a cooling effect because you've got this water that emanates from the plants. Whenever water is in the process of vaporizing, that has a cooling effect. And this regulates temperatures, it regulates weather and makes our landscape drought resistant. Benefits of taller grass, number two, taller grass allows more blooms for pollinators, so our pollinators have more food to live on. 
benefits of taller grass number three. Taller grass provides a place for tree seedlings to grow. Some of these seedlings will make nice shade trees and fruit trees if you allow them to grow. When you see them, protect them with a stake or a cage and let them grow. Number four, benefits of taller grass. Taller grass absorbs more carbon. The blades of the grass and the leaves of weeds, aka wildflowers, take carbon from the air and put it into the soil. Number five, taller grass has deeper roots. This is good for soil health. Our, our climate needs healthy soils that soak up more rainwater. This makes our yard more drought proof. It recharges the groundwater. It makes the groundwater flow gradually into the streams and waterways. Benefits of taller grass number six, taller grass allows for more plant diversity. The plant diversity is good for soil health because each plant species attracts its own set of fungi and soil microorganisms. The soil need, it, healthy soil, it has an ecosystem in there and the, the, the starting place for the ecosystem, what stimulates the entire ecosystem is a diversity of plants. Each plant has a special relationship with a certain set of microorganisms, a certain set of fungi. And when you have a diversity, you're just gonna have a more diverse soil ecosystem. And that soil ecosystem is gonna perform the function of sustaining healthy plants, delivering nutrition to the plants, uh, making the plants drought resistant, disease resistant, Healthy soil is also going to absorb much more water than soil that is not healthy. And, and one of the main indicators of healthy soil is how much carbon does it have? So that's another conversation, but the healthier the soil is, the more it's gonna absorb carbon year after year after year. And when it absorbs carbon, it also absorbs water. The water uh, contributes to green growth and makes your landscape more drought proof. So the benefits of taller grass, the summary, taller grass absorbs more water, it absorbs more carbon, it nurtures healthy soils, it nurtures plant diversity, it allows trees to grow and it provides for pollinators. So we've talked about what we normally do versus what we should do, how to mow higher and the benefits of taller grass. Now, in conclusion, what we can do is mow only where we have to and we'd eat the rest. Top off grass with the weed eater at six to nine inches. Notice tree seedlings and protect them whenever a tree is in a favorable location. Some of these little volunteer trees are just gonna, they're gonna be in a perfect place. And that volunteer tree is gonna be healthier and grow better because it's a volunteer. As compared with something that's transplanted or something that's grown at a nursery. Uh, also in conclusion, the benefits of this method are, one, our yard absorbs more carbon and generates less carbon. Number two, our yard absorbs more water. Number three, our soil becomes more fertile. Number four, we have more plant diversity. And number five, we have more habitat for bees, butterflies, and birds. In future videos and presentations, we can talk about how to grow healthy trees with less time and effort, how to nurture healthy soils, how to capture rainwater, how to make your backyard a wildlife habitat. This has been your climate-friendly backyard. Grow more, mow less. So that's the end of my prepared comments. I welcome questions, comments, observations. Feel free to tell me where you're from. Did you, did you find this through water and climate or some other means? Maybe my personal page, maybe uh, I'm president of Wild Ones Louisville, the native plant organization here in Louisville, Kentucky, USA. And um, so that some people might be, might've found out about this from there. So did anything, Hi. yeah. Hi. Hi there. Hi, Hello Marin. from Pittsburgh. Um, Welcome. We're, uh, we have a new chapter of Wild Ones uh, starting up. A friend of mine has been instrumental in that, although I don't see him on here. 
And I think I just got wind of it through Facebook, through your personal page or your water page. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. Um, but as you can see, I am an aficionado. Oh, here, I'll just turn the thing around so I can see it too. So I am an aficionado of the Moles. This is a little patch of grass. It's full of clover and other things, the clover and the grass I planted, and it's at about six inches high. Mm. Um, back here, it's a little higher. Uh, back in this section, in fact, it's, I haven't mown this from, I think I've mown it once this year. So that chair, which is kind of broken, but it, you can see its feet disappearing. So, uh, so yeah, I have probably the most biodiverse <laughs> quarter acre in Pittsburgh with stuff I've planted and stuff that just grows. Mm -hmm. Good. One um, observation is that if you've mown it only once this year, think about how much less carbon and pollutants you're spewing out. Oh, I don't spew. I right, have a, I know. The, a real um, mower. Right. I'm, I'm not spewing anything. Oh, okay. Because right. I don't use a powered mower. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a Fisker's uh, real mower, which has a little flywheel in it, so it looks works a little better than the real mower we used to have. Right. Um, and I'm also a Phipps Master Gardener and about to embark on a sustainable landscaping teaching. Uh, they, they are recruiting people to, to lecture about that. So sustainable landscaping, is that a course and is it through an organization of some sort? Uh, Phipps, oh, sorry, Phipps uh, Conservatory is, and I'll turn this around, I guess. Um, da, 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 da. Uh, Phipps Conservatory is, is a conservatory in botanical gardens. Um, there's a, uh, and it was, it's very, apart from just the green of growing things and being a conservatory in botanical gardens, it's, it's very green oriented. It had like the first most efficient, they, they did an expansion of their, the original glass houses were some because I know that the initial collection included the leftovers from the Chicago World's Fair. Um, and they, uh, um, did have had a multi-phase green renovation project, including an underground visitor center and a new tropical forest greenhouse and new production greenhouses. And they're like the most efficient, at, when they were built, they were the most efficient in the world in various ways. Um, they have Center for Sustainable Landscapes, which is a very, efficient and it's it's uh i think it, it may have done the living building challenge which both uh omits any materials on the red list and processes all its own water and own um uh wastewater and collects all its water and produces all its own energy although there was a little scale jumping uh jumping to other facilities on the property so there's a, it has a, the conservatory has a master garden program, which is a training program that um, will participate in and, and they volunteer program. Uh, we volunteer for carrying out and planting shows, but also doing education in the community to form of education in the city um, that they're starting up where they're, and I've taught, I've done teaching and lecturing on gardening and permaculture kind of stuff, as well as climate, um, also a climate reality leader. And, um, and also I was lecturing on climate before climate reality came to town. <clears throat> My spouse is a climate scientist. So it might be interesting to get you two in a room sometime sure. to Absolutely. talk about the relative um impact of uh of water and i agree that water is important whether you know how it it's definitely all interrelated and we right. also so i'm 
as you can see, I'm all about building soil and being biodiverse um, and in most case being edible. This is the bring around to the uh, the your internet's cutting out a little bit man yeah i will go i will go to better internet let somebody else talk while i go okay. up to the roof well one thing i noticed you have some logs out there and i don't know if you're using that for firewood or not but i i bring in a lot of dead leaves limbs and logs for just for fertilizing purposes uh a climate friendly backyard is going to have Google you know, culture. A, yeah, I have. Let me just make a few comments about the, you know, dead leaves, limbs, and logs. To me, there are like, you know, six ways of six major strategies for capturing rainwater. And one of them is to have, you know, brush piles and leaves and logs that, you know, what purpose are they going to serve? They're going to absorb rainwater. They're going to, uh, you know, decomposers are going to go get busy with dead leaves, limbs, and logs. And decomposers include, you know, worms and insects and the like. And they're going to serve to break down the wood. And when they're doing their work, they're going to aerate the soil. They're going to cycle nutrients in the soil. And uh, so what we need to do is have less yard waste and treat our yard waste as valuable, uh, you know, valuable material to put on the soil or in the soil. I agree there too. I'm... Uh common feature of autumn in Pittsburgh is Marin running around picking up other people's bags of leaves. Right, exactly. And random logs as well. And yes, I bury them in Google culture, which because when they're buried, I just put them as the base of brush piles and composty stuff. Mm -hmm. So I... Uh, so what happens over the there. course of time when you put that, you know, Hugo culture is when you bury a log in the ground or you know maybe maybe it's underground or maybe it's just underneath a pile of leaves or wood chips mm -hmm. etc so what happens over the course of time and what are the benefits of that um soil microbes go in and break it down and i think the cellular the structure of the wood just makes it really good for uh absorbing water it, it becomes quite spongy right so i have a section where um, the retaining, uh, I've sort of subsumed an old retaining wall and put logs in front of it to help make sure the hillside stays up because the hillside belongs to my neighbor. Um, but I've buried logs and then I'm just bringing biomass to it. And sometimes that's stuff that I'm pulling up because while I'm very biodiverse, I don't necessarily, um, uh, want certain things that are just super duper invasive. I just try to control them before they go to seed. So I'm not having a bigger issue with that plant in the future. So I let things grow big and then I pull them out and hack off the seed heads or the flower heads. So that's, or, and I also, another tactic to avoid getting rid of biomass ever is um, if I have things which are, going to seed or have enough oomph in their plant body to go to seed, I consolidate that all into a single, uh, certain areas where, okay, that brush pile has seeds and they can compete with each other and it's near the path so I can control them. Um, but I, I don't believe in bagging up any kind of biomass right. and sending it away. I bring other people's biomass to my house. Exactly. And this is my battery on my phone is about to die, so I may okay. go in. But this is the roof garden, by the way, mm -hmm. um, with solar panels and more water retention. Right. There's storm water. So and 
food. Yeah. So let me talk about a little bit about when you do let your grass grow a little taller, what are you going to have to deal with? We have city ordinances and homeowner associations, et cetera, that have certain rules. We need to know what those rules are. But at, at the same time, you know, so number one, know what the rules are in your area. Number two, try to educate your neighbors. And one way of educating the neighbors is to have signs that say wildlife habitat, pollinator garden, et cetera. So, and, try, and then thirdly, I would say, you know, try to make it the areas that are visible, front yard especially, try to make it a little bit neat, you know. So try to conform when you can. So does anybody have any stories they can tell about challenges with cities or homeowners associations? Let me uh, say generally, when it comes to, like, to me, if you ask Harv Hagen, most of the problems that we have in the world can be solved if we rehydrate the earth. I mean, you've got weather extremes, you've got drought, famine, hurricanes, floods, uh, inequality, uh, you've got poverty. Many of these problems could be solved if we would rehydrate the earth with all the benefits that go along with that, including restoration of water cycles. And so the five strategies, generally speaking, to rehydrate the earth, one is plants. Let plants grow more instead of cutting so much. And we have, as a species, we have eliminated about half of the green plant matter in our history. So you can't keep eliminating plant matter and expect that to go well. We need to, you know, grow more. We need to have uh, green plants in our agricultural fields. We need to deforest less. We need to understand that the droughts that we're having are from deforestation. And, you know, deforestation, it, 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 to some extent, deforestation starts where we are. Uh, so we can, you know, that's why we're talking about yards. So strategy number one, green plants. Strategy number two, build healthy soils uh, instead of degrading the quality of our soils by packing it down, by using chemical fertilizers, chemical pesticides, uh, monocultures, lack of diversity. We need to build healthy soils. Number three, small earthworks, like, you know, uh, try to slow down the water. When the rain falls and it's rushing off your property, we're going to try to slow that down through, you know, swales, small dams, small ponds. And fourth, we is, want to, we want to use, I have actually, uh, let me, let me finish that. Let me finish this, Marin. And uh, we want to use dead leaves, limbs and logs to absorb the water, to uh, attract decomposers, to start an ecosystem there. And lastly, we need to, have ecosystems, not just plants, but ecosystems. Ecosystems are composed of plants, animals, fungi, and microorganisms, among other things. So we need to understand that it's functioning ecosystems that are going to restore our water cycles. It's functioning ecosystems that are going to uh, have a cooling effect. Uh, they're going to cause clean air, clean water, et cetera. So those are my five strategies generally for rehydrating the earth, capturing the rain where it falls. Yes, Marin. Um, I just happened to be out uh, here. Well, first I was showing the pollinator habitat and wildlife habitat signs on the front entryway, but this is an example of exactly what you're talking about, a bioswale. This driveway, which belongs to my neighbor, drain, it's a pretty big like four cars will fit in it. And it drains not to its drain, but down this slope. And this slope just came down to my path and all the water from that big four car driveway just rushed down and would flood my basement sometimes. And so I, I dug down a trench and improved the soil and planted all kinds of, oh, this is goji berries and service berries, and there was a volunteer peach tree, and there's fennel, and there's Ella campaign. And um, it does help slow the water. I call it my hedgeable because it's kind of long and skinny and therefore like a hedge. And 
is got a lot of edible stuff in it. Mm -hmm. So, but it is a bioswale that is just doing exactly that and just looking at it from end on. This this whole big driveway um, drains down there, and it really does help slow the water. It doesn't eliminate the water, but it slows it a lot, and that has helped avoid basement flooding. So when I think of a swale, it, 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 is there any digging that's involved or do you just have like a row of plants that are kind of on kind I, I did dig down. Mm -hmm. So the soil level, I, I kind of dug in and improved the soil so the plants would grow better. And also it would be more absorptive. And I found that when I do, when I improve the soil with anything, compost usually um the worms go crazy and they help mix it out into the side so whenever i'm making a trench or a hole to plant a tree i will um dig into the sides of the hole to give worms and water a chance to, to infiltrate so, so dig into the sides into the sides of the trench, yeah. Mm -hmm. And and then I improved it with compost and such. And these are the signs that you were describing. It's like yeah. you're you're in your room because you're doing a PowerPoint, but I got on on my phone and can walk around and illustrate the stuff that you're talking about, which sure. is kind of fun. So here's the pollinator habitat, wildlife habitat. And I have I have had some issues with certain neighbors um and once or twice i got a call from the city and in our in pittsburgh the rule is grass isn't supposed to be more than 12 inches high. like nothing is supposed to be more than 12 inches high unless it's a flower but i i called the inspector whose name was on the notice and i had a conversation and i cleaned up a few bunches of piled logs and moved some tools off the front porch which you can't even really see in the summer this is the front porch <laughs> Um, and, uh, just to have done something and then they didn't bother me after that. Um, so, how long ago so was that? uh, there were two different neighbors, one of whom thankfully is gone and the other of whom is still here, but he goes, comes and goes and how obstreperous he is. Um, uh, but one was probably within the last couple of years and one was probably six or eight years. And that's when I learned about, you know, it's not supposed to be more than 12 inches high unless it's a flower, but most plants do flower one way or another. And mm -hmm. I right. just, I said, my front yard is bushy. It's fruit trees and herbs. Mm -hmm. And there are some flowers there too. Some ornamentals. This mm -hmm. is a uh, wine berry that I'm trying to uh, make sure it doesn't get too out of hand, but and there's like eight fruit trees in the front yard there. And mm -hmm. I basically had a phone conversation and defended my, the biodiversity and the edibility. And they let me alone. It's a good point. You know, I think 90% you know? of plants are angiosperms. Angiosperms by definition ha have a flower. That's how they reproduce. Yeah. So. Yep. Where so, do you get your compost? Do you make all your own compost or do you bring some in? I make a lot of my own compost. And right now I need to go in in order to plug in. Um, I make a lot of my own compost, but uh, I also get, there's a outfit just outside of Pittsburgh that collects from institutions and restaurants and things. And uh, they sell um, so when I was first coming to the site, which had the hardly any topsoil, it was clay and grass, and um, I probably brought in about 40 yards of compost, and I now get it a few buckets a month through a local nonprofit that has a home gardening resource center. How long have you been there? That um, you you have a membership and then each month you can go get so many buckets of 
compost and on top soil and mulch. Moon, your your internet's fading out a little and, bit. Uh, let's let's see if we can hear from anybody else. So, anybody else want to? Um, it looks nothing like it. Oh, yeah, I would love to. Yeah. So, uh, Ann, Mark, Lionel, Pam, you have this something is, you'd like to share? Hi, Ann. Yeah, this is Ann. Um, so, I have. I lived in California most of my life and I had a native garden there. And um, so this is an interesting conversation about the, the lawn because when I was in California, I was able just to get rid of the lawn totally. Um, now I'm in New Mexico and it's uh, Bermuda grass. And I, we're in the process of having, uh, getting some xeriscaping in because it's New Mexico and water saving is such a huge deal. Um, and all of the uh, landscapers say, you can't get rid of a Bermuda grass. Like it's, it's just really invasive. So I've been trying to figure out, you know, um, so it's a good conversation because maybe it's just, I just don't, you know, have it mowed very much or I'm not, you know, it's my original plan was to get rid of it, but it sounds like it's not the best thing to do. So, um, so this is a good conversation because maybe just, some of the you know different weeds will come up that are beneficial right. and will be will be helpful. Another thing I wanted to comment on is uh, when I was in San Jose, you know, I was in a very suburban area. Um, and one of the benefits, it's strange, is I no longer got ants in my house um, when I transformed the lawn to a native garden and you know because usually that's a everybody complains right and the certain times of the year all the ants come in and I didn't and I went outside and they were all in the yard so that was really kind of a why, neat why did it happen that way so you're saying you didn't have any ants inside why was that well usually um in in California I know in other places you know you get ants who that come into the house and you have to control them. Um, what I noticed was after I got rid of all the lawn and did the native landscaping, I no longer had ants coming into the house. You think and, they had plenty of food outside? And they, yeah, and I just hadn't thought of it before, but I really appreciated that mm -hmm. benefit. Right. You know, because I'm not, I don't like calling ants pests. Let's yeah, put it right. that way. You right. know, they're just an animal that, you know, where we've kind of taken away their home. So that was a really nice benefit to me. Mm -hmm. So that's it. I like welcoming ants. I, I consider myself like a worm farmer and an ant farmer. And oh, you know, cool. I, I've heard yeah. that, uh, like there's in terms of biomass, mm -hmm. there, there, like most of the biomass in the world is, is plant matter. But if you take away the plant matter and you're left with with animals, like most of the animal biomass is underneath the ground. And if you have healthy mm -hmm. soils, like mm -hmm. five or 10 times more biomass is underground. So it's very significant. Uh, the, the ants, the worms, the insects, the, uh, the grubs, the centipedes, millipedes, pill bugs, they all have a, a role to play yeah. uh, underneath the ground. And, you know, healthy soils is like, uh, I don't think I may, uh, maybe I did mention that, but Healthy soils are one of the main things that we need in this world. Mm -hmm. you know, farming, farming, uh, traditional farming, traditional landscaping are not good for soil. You know, synthetic fertilizers are not good for soil. Pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, insecticides are not good for soil. So uh, when we have healthy soil, it absorbs water. You know, healthy soil is at least half void spaces that are going to be filled up with either air or water mm -hmm. and that air and water is important to you know living things need air and water and uh the uh, one of the i keep trying to think of what is the sixth thing if we're going to rehydrate the earth and named five things and i knew i was forgetting something what i forgot was animal engineers 
Mm -hmm. uh, you know, animal engineers think of an animal. I mean, you know, beavers are obviously animal engineers. Cattle can be animal engineers. Donkeys can be, but also worms, insects. They, they're digging around in the soil. They're aerating the soil. They're delivering nutrients. They're, they're going to be, they're, they're part of the food chain. So they're going to be food for some type, you know, many birds and other insects, et cetera. So all that is just very significant. And we tend to not think about it because we live above ground. So it's out of sight, out of mind. But that underground ecosystem is just so important. It can, uh, you know, three of the things that I've mentioned here, you, you know, when it comes to climate, we need to absorb carbon. We need to absorb water. Healthy soil does that. We need to nurture complete ecosystems. Uh, you know, there's those complete ecosystems that are going to facilitate the restoration of our water cycles. It's those complete ecosystems that are going to create a situation where rain soaks into the ground and then it gradually gets released into the streams, which is what we need. So I'm, I'm proud of bringing in compost and, and things yes. like that. E even if I didn't grow anything above ground, if I'm bringing in compost and wood chips and leaves, limbs, and logs, and uh, just between you and me, I pick up roadkill <laughs> and put it back there. And, uh, you know, so we'll see how that goes. But, you know, it, you're inviting decomposers. Deadwood invites decomposers and decomposers are the beginning of a food chain. Right. The dead animals are uh, invite decomposers and the decomposers just nurture mm -hmm. those food chains. No, I, I, I'm right on with you about that. I've been involved in healthy soils for a while. And I think the thing that I really appreciate um, and I try to get the word out as much as possible is what you're talking about is when we save, when we help, we work with healthy soil or the ecosystem, we're saving an entire system. And I get so frustrated with black and white solutions mm -hmm. because they don't solve anything. Right. If, you know, it's not, you can't just, Put a carbon price on things it has to be um you know again you've already said it if you're saving the soil you're saving the water system you're saving the pollinators on and on and on and on mm -hmm. right yeah <clears throat> well you know i I've, I've done 315 episodes on a show called the climate report uh, most of that was before i really got a clue as to how important water was and um i forget where well all along uh, it's like in 2018, I started to get a clue that, yeah, climate is really important and climate is really urgent. Uh, it, even then, I never, I always felt that it's complete, uh, complete ecosystems are what we need to save. Mm -hmm. Plus, the loss of biodiversity is mm -hmm. at least as important as climate itself. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it, it, it it's, um, it's inconceivable that we can survive, let alone thrive, if, uh, I, the, I agree. if, if we keep on killing off all of the, yeah. the animals, plants, fungi that we need. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I agree. And it's disrespectful, at mm -hmm. least to me. Right. So. Right. So, so, uh, so you can think in terms of like, why save the natural world? And, you know, uh, do we save it for pragmatic reasons because uh, out of enlightened self-interest or do we save it because the natural world is inherently valuable, inherently beauty, do we uh, inherently beautiful? Do we see ourselves as uh, uh, what, what's it called? Like a species, like a democracy of species. You know, other species have a right to exist just like we do. Yeah. And uh, so, so there's that. And not everybody's going to buy into that. But you know, I know. I'm, not in, I'm not insisting on that, but it's pretty compelling. Yeah. And then there's the enlightened self-interest. We just can't keep making war on the rest right. of the living world and expect to to survive or th probably be a few people that can survive that but yeah. you know, a lot of suffering a lot of suffering a lot of loss a lot of degradation that's going to occur if we don't turn it around pretty quick and i think most yeah. people want to i think most people want to yeah. uh, when they find out about it I, you know we're we're ruled by institutions that are just out of control yeah. so i don't think it's human nature i think it's 
these institutions that rule us and we have to figure out how to, you know, <laughs> how to do what's rational instead yeah, of- Yeah, well, I think rational. anytime you can, we just um, can share the information, it's helpful. Mm -hmm. So yeah. what part of New Mexico are you in? I'm in uh, Albuquerque and I'm actually in an area, it's a little village called Los Ranchos. And so uh, what's different about this is I'm, it's in an area called the Bosque. So it's closer to the Rio Grande. So I actually have more water here um, than in other parts of, uh, of Albuquerque. So okay. mm -hmm. it's very, but it's, there's a lot here. The, um, there's a, a lot of local farming. Um, the village of the Los Ranchos village is uh, very proactive with uh, farming, uh, local farming and then teaching. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of positives about right. being here. I saw a video the other day with Jeff Lawton, and I don't, I apologize, I don't remember if he was in Arizona or New Mexico, I know they're two entirely different states, but, but he was in, <laughs> he was in one or the other, uh, and he, there was this swale that, that was built, he, he looked like he was on, you know, dozens of acres, if not hundreds of acres, and the, there was this swale that was built in the New Deal era. Mm. And since then, it has been, it, it is remarkably like self-sustaining mm. and it's this green, it's an oasis. Wow. And so it's an illustration of how if you capture water and, and have a reasonable amount of attention to biodiversity, then you have something that it produces fruit. It's, it's like tens of degrees cooler than the surrounding area. It captures right. water. So there's just so much of a, it's a small investment for big gains, you know? Yeah. Plus, I mean, California is, it did, it has not always been as dry as it is. Uh, we, we can't see ourselves, uh, you know, I, I sympathize with people who have to go through drought and experience all that. But uh, as a species, we made California dry mm -hmm. uh, in the 1830s. Uh, we went and before there was a gold rush, there was a rush on beaver pelts and beavers were killed. They, uh, continent wide in North America, there used to be two to 300 beaver, two to 300 million beavers. Uh -huh. And now we're down to about 10 million. Also, uh -huh. there used to be about, used to be about 8% of the uh, surface area in North America was fresh water, largely uh -huh. because of the beavers. Uh -huh. So we, we get rid of the beaver, not just the beavers, but you know, we, we deforest, we destroy the soil, we get rid of prairie dogs, we get rid of all these animal engineers, we get rid of the forests, we, uh, we destroy the soil. We're just setting the state, we're creating the conditions for drought and it doesn't have to be that way. No, I agree with you. I Plus agree. When, when farmers drill way down for irrigation, uh, that the water table goes down, streams and rivers tend to be more vulnerable to drought. And uh, yeah. I just read something the other day, you know, these river ecosystems mm -hmm. are vulnerable because you take away the water table, then that water table might otherwise serve as a buffer uh, for helping the stream or waterway be have a more continuous flow. That continuous flow helps maintain the water table and also it helps maintain the plants in the riparian buffer so you know we have to start getting our rain from rainfall um i was reading about john kempf is a amish uh, gentleman real expert in soil health and and uh, a consultant for agriculture in pennsylvania and he says, you know, some people will spend $5,000 to build a well. I'll spend $60,000 to build a couple of ponds. <laughs> and that I 60, that. but I know that if I spend $60,000 to build a couple of ponds, instead of doing it on the cheap $5,000 for a well, that I'm going to have a million dollar crop instead of an $800,000 crop. So, you know, Pennsylvania is not California, but we, you know, that the groundwater is not going to last forever if you keep no. drilling it. And it's just, it's just a matter of time before we're not going to have it anyway. Why don't we start, you know, using these five strategies I've laid out, you know, grow plant matter, healthy soils, small earthworks like dams and bioswales, et cetera, 
dead leaves, limbs, and logs, ecosystem, you know, complete functioning ecosystems, and animal engineers. We can do that. And you know, we have we have a really messed up idea of what wealth is. We think of wealth as financial wealth that's mainly held by the rich and the upper middle class. We could create wealth for the poor and the middle class if we would restore functioning ecosystems. Now, that, that's a very true and real source of wealth as long as we don't sabotage but we have to invest in it instead of sabotaging it right well i think the one of the positive things about california and a few other states is the healthy soils initiative and i don't know if you're familiar with that but yeah it's um it's helping tell me it's, more about it <clears throat> well it's a program that helps uh, farmers transition from uh, conventional methods into um, regenerative methods. Um, it's not perfect, but they've been doing it since I think 2017. And so they've been a lot of the small, well, a lot of farmers have been able to do that. And one of the benefits, of course, is I think California provides something like 40% of all our, you know, fruits and vegetables. It's huge. Right, right. You know, it's gigantic. Um, but it's it's a start. It's a start. And um, there's Massachusetts, there's, I think Hawaii, of course, was one of the first states <laughs> and to have a healthy soils initiative. Uh, New Mexico has a healthy soils program. So they're wonderful programs in that they help fund uh, the farmer's transition, um, which is actually in the scheme of things pretty quick. It's like five years. You know, that's the other thing about the whole uh, creating healthy soil is it happens so quickly. You know, it's really not, it's not a 20 year process. And then when you have healthy soil, the value of your farm, for one thing, exactly. the value of your farm goes up. Uh, every, anytime you Everything. increase the soil carbon, the value of your farm goes up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Plus you're shelling out less for inputs, Correct. fertilizers, insect, all these biocides and right. patented seeds. Right. And I think, but I think one of the biggest things is protecting farmers because, you know, if you're, a lot of farmers are reliant upon, you know, the, the agriculture corporations. And so they're not, um, they're reliant upon um, the larger companies, certain pesticides, certain fertilizers. Um, so they're reliant upon them. Um, and if the farmer gets in trouble, then they can, they'll get, they'll, they can run out of business. But that's, so that's the other benefit to the Healthy Soils Program is it helps protect the farmer as they're doing the transition. Mm -hmm. So. You know, one thing, Mark Shepard is really good, author of Restoration Agriculture. And he says, you know, the truth is agriculture is not profitable. <laughs> and, you know, you have. That's why all farmers have off-farm jobs. Yeah, right. Yeah, if you look, at love. The, you look at the stats, look at the data, look at the revenue, the expenses, farming is not profitable. So, right. and, and, you know, people, uh, farmers will just, they'll work morning to night, plus they're off farm jobs, try to maintain that farm. There's such a passion and a dedication yeah. and we're not meeting them halfway. No, we, we need to, well, we need to support addicted, them. The country's addicted to cheap food. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Well, we, yeah, we have cheap food. Uh, uh, what we're addicted to is the rule. I'm, I'm not correcting you. I'm just saying that, you know, Monsanto has bought your congressperson, you know, I mean, the, 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 the agribusiness corporations, they have such a heavy influence on the legislative process that they run the show. Yeah. Did Mark, did Mark want to show his yard? Yeah. Mark? Yeah, he's out there. Yeah. Hey, hey, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Oh, good. Yeah. I'm just sitting out here in the, on the driveway. Hart, you've been over here. What's your last name, Mark? Uh, Richie. Uh, uh, Richie. You're in Louisville? Yeah, you've been here. Oh, um, yeah, of course. Uh, friends with Mar Mary, Mary Ellen. Ellen Baker. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you've been, yeah. Of course. So you're always invited to come over for a cocktail. 
<laughs> I'll I'll bring my guitar and I'll make you're, you listen. You're welcome for. I mean, I'm that's what I'm doing. I'm sitting out here having a cocktail and enjoying my canis and the birds and. Yeah, let's have a Manhattan. Oh yes, definitely. <laughs> well, your yard looks really nice. Yeah, thank you. Now, I I don't know if you can see this tree. I have a sugar maple that just yeah. in one day, like when poof, oh. it's got all brown leaves and <clears throat> it's pretty big. Oh, and I, I it's so, sorry. I'll take some of those dead logs off your hands. If you end up cutting down the tree and put it in, the <laughs> wall, I'll, I'll come and pick it up. Well, I, I wanted to. I tried to get the fella to prune it for me, but he didn't really want to prune it because I did so, see a couple of green leaves. <laughs> so we're looking at, we're, it's kind of hard to see. We're looking at a big sugar maple that died. Yeah, no that's way, not that looking better. too yeah, happy. Yeah, I can see it now. Now, different types of trees lose their leaves at different times. Well, I think the tree but are there it seems awfully early yeah, for this sugar right. maple. Well, this one's uh, 70 plus years and it's, uh, I think it's on its way out. Gotcha. Mm. <laughs> well, with that tree gone, you're going to have a lot more light shining on your jewel weed. And I'm sure Mary Ellen will be happy about that. Uh, the jewel weed's going to grow even more than it did before. Mm. I'm, I'm playing around. I love jewel weed. I think it. Jewel but, weed's happy enough in the shade. Yeah, but right. I also lost a big maple. It was a silver maple from my backyard, and that's where I've now got cannas and milkweed and milkweed and what else? All kinds of stuff. Oh, all kinds of stuff. A uh, bunch of shrubs and all kinds of things. More herbs, uh, just because I have sun where I didn't have sun before. So some of the gardens were new this that you saw in my little tour. It's now dark here. Mm -hmm. uh, were um that's all new this year well not all of it but where the cannas were if you notice that i've got a bunch of seeds i got seeds from the roundstone native seed is a good you know vendor of native seeds i got a bunch of native seeds i just need to stop overthinking it and just throw them out i got you know, <laughs> pollinator mixes and mm -hmm. i got yeah. some real cheap cover crop seeds but i also got some mm -hmm. pollinator mixes some for wet areas and some for dry areas and uh -huh. i just need to throw them out and stop thinking that i'm i'm gonna like prepare this you know you, you have to kill the grass you don't have to kill the grass first it's good if you kill the grass first so how are you going to do that i guess i'll put down some you know i don't know maybe plastic maybe uh, a board i just put down Something. cardboard cardboard and a bunch okay. of loose sure. just composty stuff yeah and then i just made and I put some plants in right away, but I made pockets of soil. I didn't have enough soil at the time. So I made pockets of soil in the compost. Mm -hmm. And I made just sort of raised, long raised beds of, of the composty stuff. And then I raised the pads between them. You may have noticed when I was walking around those bark pads and that's mm -hmm. the bark is just raising, there's wood chips underneath it. And then the bark, I just had a bunch of bark, so I put it there, um, but in an attempt to raise the path so that the beds aren't high and dry. Mm -hmm. um, I do need to go because we're sitting okay. down to supper, but Hart, I would love to talk to you more um, and maybe involve you in an upcoming uh, event that I'm doing. I organize a monthly environmental education event uh, called Sustainability Salon. They are now in their 10th year um, become kind of a local institution, but now that they're on Zoom because of the pandemic, normally they're a giant public mini conference, um, they have less geographical limitations for participants and uh, also um, for speakers. Yeah, do you? And there's, you um, can we're send trying to send me a message yeah. on Messenger if we're connected yeah, on yeah. Facebook. Yeah, we're Facebook friends. Yeah, yeah. great. And uh, I'd love to help. Yeah, because in particular, there's a local forest that's in danger for development. And so somebody who can, you know, who isn't me, who can 
or the local activists in that neighborhood who can talk, you know, so uh, eloquently about the importance of forest for waters. Because while we don't lack for water here mostly, um, and we don't, we're not using groundwater, we're using uh, surface river water. Um, it's so hilly here that there is a lot of flooding, especially as development has happened. So uh, there's a, a patch of trees that should stay that way. Uh, and so advocating, it'd be great to have you join that. I was just planning that with somebody today. And I said, yeah. and, then, and then you gave this talk and I said, yes, heart would be great to have. Happy to, uh, happy to do it. That, that's what yeah. I live for. Yeah, well, cool, cool. Well, thank you very so, much. Um, thank you, Anne. Oh, and Peaches says hello. Oh, hello. Peaches. Uh, Peaches is a sweet mm, darling. darling. Yeah. Oh, Peaches is a Peaches. girl. 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 Oh, Peaches, she's so sweet cute. as she can be. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Love anyway, it. well, I'm going to go sit down okay. over there. Have, we got the family having evening. dinner. Bye bye. All righty. Bye bye. I'll see you. Uh, uh, thank you again, Hart. Thank you. Yeah. Nice to meet you, Marin. Indeed. Well, okay, I guess that's it. Thank you, everybody, for joining me. If you're watching the recording, thank you for. Uh, oh, there's Lionel. Mm -hmm. Hey, my friend. Has been, has been a great lesson for me, and oh, I agree with uh, 100% of what you've been talking. I'm not in um, this kind of field. Um, I have a degree in medicine, but I absolutely agree with you that we have the hydrate the earth, and we have to rehydrate the earth to save the, the climate stuff. Mm -hmm. So I look forward to to see if you can put this in your group, so I can share with um, a lot of people here in Mexico. I'm very, very thankful with all of you. Mm. And thanks so much for doing this. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk. I'm planning on doing this weekly. So we'll talk again soon. Okay. Have a good night. Talk to you later, Mark. Okay. Good night. Good night. <laughs>